Yeah, I cut into my own time. <laughs> so, uh, should I shut myself up? <laughs> okay. Well, speaking of Peter, uh, our next speaker has developed an outstanding reputation both inside and outside of academia, having worked uh, extensively in both, uh, basically, uh, institutions. So he has made uh, a lot of uh, contribution, especially in the area of derivative pricing, both theoretical and applied. Uh, Peter now is in the academic world, and he's the chair of the finance and risk at in engineering at NYU's Tandon School of Engineering. He has headed various quant groups in the financial industry for the past 20 years. He also presently serves as a trustee of National Museum of Mathematics and the World Quant University. Uh, prior to joining the financial industry, Dr. Carr was a finance professor for eight years at Cornell University after opening his PhD from UCLA. He has over 85 publications in academic and industry-oriented journals and serves as an associate editor of eight journals related to financial mathematics. Uh, Professor Carr was selected as Quant of the Year by Risk Magazine in 2003 and Financial Engineer of the Year by IAQF Songard in 2010. We are very happy to have him here. He has been listed uh, as one of the top 50 uh, technology uh, gurus in the financial industry. So we are looking forward to his talk. And actually, I've seen a portion of his talk. I think that's the same one, and it's fascinating. He's going to talk about the history of uh, derivatives uh, last 50 years. So Peter, the stage is yours. Thank you. Yeah, you should be able to share a screen. Yeah, okay, very good. Okay, I'm ready to go. So the title of my talk is A Half Century of Derivatives Pricing. And um, here's an overview. Um, talk about that topic. I want to talk about a particular paper that's 50 years old and some follow-on work to what's called contingent claims analysis. So today we had yet another October surprise. Uh, today we learned that the President of the United States and the First Lady of the United States uh, both contracted COVID-19, or at least tested positive. And um, the, there was a negative stock market reaction this morning, and it reminds me of this quote. October, this is one of the peculiarly dangerous months to speculate in stocks. The others are July, January, September, April, November, May, March, June, December, August, and February. So the um, quote is due to Mark Twain. And um, those of you expecting a 50-year survey of hundreds or thousands of papers on derivatives pricing are in for another October surprise. Um, I plan to mostly cover exactly one paper today, uh, which was written 50 years ago. Um, it's my thesis that the kernel of all of the work in Drew's pricing since then is contained in that one working paper. So there's a particular finance paper that I consider the most amazing ever written. Uh, it came out in December 1970. It was written by Robert C. Merton, who's in the same geographic area as many of you. And um, so he was at MIT at the time as a doctoral student. And um, he began circulating um, a paper um, called the Dynamic General Equilibrium Model of the Asset Market and its application to the pricing of the capital structure of the firm. And, um, you know, <laughs> when people think of the big hits in finance, somehow they miss this one. Um, but um, let me try and convince you that they should not. So, um, <clears throat> so, uh, it turns out that some, but not all, the main ideas in the paper were published separately in papers by Merton in 1973 and 74. And uh, that the working paper itself was published as chapter 11 of his famous 1990 book called Continuous Time Finance. So 50 years from the original working paper, um, we talk of something called the Merton model. And it describes, as many of you know, an arbitrage free approach for valuing the debt and equity of an idealized firm relative to the value of the firm's assets. Um, so I just quickly review this Merton model as he first proposed it. He didn't call it that, of course. So let F be the function relating the value of the equity to the value V of the assets and to the time to maturity tau of the zero coupon debt. Let B be a balloon payment or a face value of the debt and assume a constant risk-free interest rate little r. So assuming that the value of the assets is a geometric Brownian motion, 
with an expected return alpha that he thought of as constant and a volatility rate sigma also constant. Then equation 65 of that paper shows that this uh, function f of asset value and time maturity tau solves a particular partial differential equation, which I'm sure many of you recognize, but um, this would have been the first time, um, well, maybe I should be careful, one of the first times that this appeared in print. <clears throat> so um, now um, in this particular problem of valuing equity of a firm, you would impose this boundary condition, that of a call on the assets of the firm, and, um, and then let's say there's a unique solution. So um, that PD, um, if we don't worry too much about what the, the inputs and outputs stand for, <laughs> um, also appears in the Black-Scholes paper. So Black-Scholes are interested in pricing options, not equity as a call option yes, the firm, but rather equity options. But anyway, that small caveat aside, that same PD appears in the Black-Scholes paper three years later. And um, you know, it's well known in 1997 uh, Scholes and Merton were each awarded the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences. Black would have been awarded, but he had died. And um, in both cases, like the, you know, you have to sort of state what the key contribution was. And actually in both cases, for both Merton and Scholes, what was stated is that they had both contributed substantially to the so-called Black-Scholes-Merton model. And um, so, so this model, you know, seems to officially go by three names, Black, Scholes, and Merton, but they never actually co-authored any paper. So it sort of raises the question, who did what when? <laughs> and um, I try to answer that question by uh, first turning to the Journal of Political Economy publication by Black and Scholes in 1973, and then go back even further to Merton's original 1970 working paper. So um, after much effort, Black and Scholes finally published in Journal of Political Economy in 1973, their paper. And um, as of today, I looked on Google Scholar, and it has 40,617 sites. So, um, so it's basically impossible for somebody to know of the option pricing literature, I would say, given that many sites. Okay, so, um, you know, and those are just the papers that happen to cite them. There's probably, there's certainly other papers that don't cite them. Okay, so the Black-Scholes paper contains one PD and several solutions um, when you subject to boundary conditions that describe the prices of European calls, European puts, and corporate bonds. Um, the, um, the, if you go back and look at the original paper, um, they derived the PD using an equilibrium model. It was the capital asset pricing model. And um, they clearly credit Merton for the no arbitrage argument uh, on page 641 of their paper, footnote three, if you want to find it. So, this is my opinion now, but I think it's fair to say that the no arbitrage argument that's based on eliminating all risk, not just non-diversifiable risk, sometimes also called uh, systematic risk, has had much greater impact on financial affairs than the equilibrium argument based on just eliminating non-diversifiable, again, sometimes called systematic risk. The equilibrium argument for example, the CAPM requires many more assumptions than the no arbitrage argument, I think, and that's probably why. So, um, so now to confirm that the fundamentally important no arbitrage argument that Black and Scholes credit to Merton is in fact due to Merton alone, I wanna next turn to my favorite working paper, uh, the one with the long title, A Dynamic General Equilibrium Model of the Asset Market and its Application of the Pricing of the Capital Structure of the Firm. So while that's a long title, it only gets a, like a small subset of what's actually in the paper. <laughs> so uh, you shouldn't assume from the title that the title describes everything in the paper. It does not. Um, so to help me with a talk I gave 10 years ago, um, Bob Merton actually sent me a PDF of his original working paper. And um, if you look at equation 65 in that paper, it's a PDE that we've seen before governing a value function in this pricing of equity as a call option in the asset of the firm context that he quite accurately calls the fundamental partial differential equation of security pricing. I mean, you know, he's got the word the there, which makes you think it's unique. And you can say it's unique in, you know, under geometric Brownian motion um, 
for path independent claims. <laughs> it's fundamental for those kinds of things. Um, you know, if you think either of path dependent claims or other models, then other other descriptions of the same phenomenon, which is essentially a martingale condition, arise. Okay, so um, the last paragraph of page 33 of the 1970 working paper begins that the equation we just looked at, equation 65, was derived previously by F. Black M. Scholes and, um, you know, and as a method for pricing option contracts. So their derivation shows that 65 holds without the assumption of market equilibrium used here. Because of its elegance, I present their fundamental approach in a fashion which makes use of Ito's lemma and the associated theory of stochastic differential equations. Consider a two-asset portfolio. Okay, and so he goes on, and what he goes on to do is the classical standard delta hedging argument, okay, where you eliminate all risk, not just systematic or non-diversifiable risk, um, okay, so the no arbitrage argument is what's in that 1970 paper at this point. And, um, okay, so now, you know, he's saying that the PD was derived by Black and Scholl's reference to here. So if you go look at the back of the paper and see what number two is, it's, it's a working paper called a theoretical valuation formula. There's probably a typo there. For options, warrants, and other securities, it's unpublished and undated. Um, so, um, so, but it was later published in the Journal of Political Economy as the Pricing of Options and Corporate Liabilities. And I don't have that original um, paper and I don't know if I can get it, but anyway. Um, so, so just repeat the quote that we had um, from Merton's 1970 working paper that the PD was derived previously by Black and Scholes as a method of pricing option contracts and that their derivation, Black and Scholes derivation, shows that that PD holds without the assumption of market equilibrium used here. So when I first read this quote, I took it to imply <laughs> that Merton did the equilibrium argument to get to the PD, while Black and Scholes did the no arbitrage argument. Okay, so I mean, he says their derivation holds without the assumption of market equilibrium. So it must be using no arbitrage. And he then, as I said, goes on to you know, illustrate their argument and uses a delta hedging argument. So, but the highly cited Black-Scholes paper actually says exactly the opposite, <laughs> that the no arbitrage argument is due to Merton, not them. So I'm confused as to who did what when. So to resolve the stalemate, um, let's take a look at the reprint of my favorite working paper that was first came out in 1970 because it was reprinted in Merton's 1990 book called Continuous Time Finance that I imagine is on many of your bookshelves. So if you look at the preface to that book written by Bob Merton, he wrote that the core of the book is a collection of 14 pre previously published papers and a widely circulated working paper written over the period spanning 1969 to the present. So the widely circulated working paper that Merton's referring to is the, you know, my personal favorite. And um, slightly further down in Merton's preface, he, he wrote, um, in reprinting these articles, I have made minor revisions in language and have corrected misprints and technical errors without indicating changes in the original. So with that in mind, let's take a look at what he wrote about that PDE in the reprint of the 70 paper in the 90 book. So here's the PDE one more time. Um, in the book, it's labeled as 11.65, which makes sense because it's in chapter 11. And um, so let's say, um, you know, making a change to equation 65 to 11.65 makes a lot of sense. Uh, so that's a minor revision in language. I'm certainly permitted to do that, but wait for it. Um, so in the 1990 book, page 379, here's what he writes. Um, equation 11.65 was previously derived by Black and Scholes 1973 as a method for pricing option contracts. Moreover, 11.65 actually holds without the assumption of market equilibrium used here. Now, believe it or not, this is worded slightly different from the original working paper. And I don't expect you to remember the way the original working paper was worded. So what I did on the next slide is I put side by side the, the two quotes. So, so at the top here, 
I have the quote from the original 1970 working paper. Um, let me read it. <laughs> Equation 65 is derived previously by F. Black M. Scholes. Number two is a method for pricing option contracts. Their derivation shows that 65 holds without the assumption of market equilibrium used here. While the reprint of that working paper in the 1990 book starts the same, you know, equation 11.65 makes sense, was previously derived by Black and Scholes, switched to 1973, makes sense, as a method for pricing option contracts. Moreover, 11.65 actually holds without the assumption of market equilibrium used here. Okay, so if you, it's a subtle change, but he drops the words, their derivation. And my personal take on this was that in dropping the words, their derivation, Merton switched from crediting Black Scholes for the no arbitrage argument in 1970 to no, no longer crediting them for that argument in 1990. <clears throat> That's how I read it. So, well, so I was confused. <laughs> I mean, on the one hand, the Black Scholes paper and um, was, and the the 1990 book is saying Merton did the no arbitrage argument, but the original 1970 working papers to me says the opposite. So, okay, so I'm let's say confused. So I emailed Bob Merton. Um, it was a few years ago, and I asked him who did what when, and um, his unequivocal reply is that he alone did the no arbitrage argument. I believe him, and Black Scholes are saying that, so it's got to, it's probably true for what that's worth. And um, in his email to me, he wrote that the original 1970 working paper meant to convey that he alone did the no arbitrage argument. So I'll flip back one slide to the top quote and try to see how in a second. But before I do that, let me just say that between 1970 and 1990, Merton realized that the wording in the original attribution was ambiguous from his perspective, so he changed the wording to correctly resolve the ambiguity. Okay, let's go back to the top quote. And so, okay, so Merton wrote me that this top quote was meant by him to indicate that he, Merton, did the no arbitrage argument and um, that Black and Scholes did not, <laughs> okay? So I personally cannot see it. Um, so it's not easy necessarily to understand what somebody means, but based on my understanding of the English language, it doesn't say that. So anyway, so I'll let you ponder that and um, I'll make these slides available. <laughs> so the fine print is important and um, so let's move on. <clears throat> so basically when I heard from Merton, who did what when, my amateur sleuthing came to an abrupt halt. <laughs> and, um, but as the great fictional detective Lieutenant Colombo would say, just one more thing. <laughs> so resolving who did what when is complicated by the fact that Merton and Black Scholes both presented equilibrium arguments to lead the PDE and both used the PDE to price corporate liabilities in their respective 1970 and 73 works. So, um, so let me get away from who says who did what when and um, let things be. Um, what I wanna do for the rest of this presentation is just focus on contingent claims analysis for pricing capital structure of the firm via no arbitrage, which is one among the many contributions of that 1970 working paper that is my favorite. So, so I once again show you this PDE and um, you know, remind you that Merton called it fundamental because all the securities in the firm's capital structure must satisfy it. And in fact, he, you know, I think in a sense we can all agree with, he solved the, the general problem in the sense of dealing with any path independent payoff. So if in general there was some payoff um, and it was um, written as f v zero. So that's just a way of describing the payoff function. That function f of v at zero is given to you. Um, then, as is well known, you can solve the PDE and write what's in the middle of this slide. So, you know, so that's in the paper. Um, so you both present the PDE and the solution in 1970. And, um, you know, he just cautions that 
um, it is a kind, while it's a kind of discount expected value formula, one should not infer that the expected return on F is R. Uh, I think we all appreciate that. In Merton's model, he called it alpha. So, or sorry, it was, sorry, I take that back. Um, the expected return on V was alpha. Uh, anyway, in general, let's say this, the expected return on a claim is a complicated thing, which I know Sanjay just spends a lot of time talking about. Okay, so um, what else is in the paper besides contingent claims analysis that we've spent so far most of this talk talking about? So if you look at other parts of the paper, you'll find the intertemporal cap M that was later published as a 1973 econometrical paper. And you'll also find a continuous time theory of the term structure of interest rates for pricing default free bonds, uh, which actually he never published except for a footnote in the 1973 rational option pricing paper. And, um, you know, both of those derivations are based on equilibrium arguments. Um, and um, the bond pricing PD that is in the Merton paper and is made famous in, the, in 1977 by Vasicek is, however, presented by assuming the expected return under P of a zero coupon bond is a short rate R. So it's, let's say, not, um, let's say, not completely satisfactory because we would, there's no reason that has to be true. <clears throat> and so in my opinion, uh, any one of the three main results in Merton's paper, um, you know, should lead to fame and fortune. Um, and, um, you know, he's certainly accrued that. And um, it's nothing short of amazing that one working paper has all three um, main ideas in it. So, <clears throat> Finance journals typically only accept papers with a, at most one idea. <laughs> I'm being snarky there. Um, but anyway, Merton had to publish three separate papers, which came out in Bell Journal in 73, Econometrica in 73, and Journal of Finance in 74. So, <clears throat> um, so I just want to talk about um, the CCA part of Merton's 1970 working paper. So with the rise of credit derivatives in the 90s, Merton's approach was recognized as one of the main approaches for dealing with default risk. Whole companies were built around extensions such as KMV, describing default as touching a barrier. So there were several famous defaults, Enron, WorldCom, Lehman, that led to an exponential increase in credit literature. And um, <clears throat> due to a lack of time in my own talk, I'm going to focus here on just two papers that extend Merton's vision. So <clears throat> after uh, well after 1970, Mark Rubenstein proposed something called displaced diffusion. So um, in Merton's approach, the value of the firm's assets follows geometric right of motion, and default occurs if this asset value finishes below the face value of the debt when it matures. So um, in this case, the debt can realize to an arbitrarily low positive value. So for example, it's there's you know, a geometric brain motion can get arbitrarily low. It, can't, it cannot actually hit zero if it starts from a positive value, but um, so, you know, if there's a default, then the bondholders get this asset value, which can be as close to zero as you'd like. So, so to prevent this occurrence, Rubenstein in 1983 pointed out that debt holders might force the firm to hold cash, <laughs> riskless collateral throughout the debt's life, which then displaces the log normal diffusion by a positive constant. So Rubenstein advocated that the firm's value process should not be geometric brownian motion, but instead shifted or displaced geometric brownian motion. And um, if you shift by an amount C greater than zero, then um, the debt with face value B would be worth at least the minimum of C and B. I mean, I called it cash, but let's say you could also hold a force the firm to hold a zero coupon bond that's a treasury or something to get to get C at the bond's maturity date. Okay, <clears throat> so um, now in Merton's setting, which is geometric brownian motion for a firm value, the difference between asset value and debt can be negative. So asset value can, fall, can be below the face value of the debt. Um, but it can never, this difference can never be algebraically below minus B because the firm value can never be below zero. And um, so, <clears throat> so in Merton's setting, he's thinking of a zero coupon bond as the only liability 
And of course, the promised payoff of zero coupon bond is bounded above. Okay, it's just the face value, a finite number. And, um, but let's consider some realistic examples of, you know, what might go on in the real world instead. I mean, consider an American insurance company, I want you to think of AIG actually, uh, selling credit protection. Um, consider a British oil company, I want you to think of British Petroleum, engaged in offshore drilling, um, or consider a Canadian hedge fund engaged in a long short strategy. A long short strategy has you both long and short stocks, let's say. Um, you're probably wondering what Canadian firm I'm thinking of, and I'm not actually thinking of any, just that Daryl and I are both Canadian, so I wanted to give us a shot, <laughs> give us a chance in there. Okay, so in all three cases, the potential liability is unbounded above. And um, so I'd like to reference a paper by Dilip Madan, my frequent co-author. Um, this paper is all his though. So when the liability does realize to a large value, um, recent history suggests um, that the other side of the firm's unbounded short position will receive its large payoff. So what I'm specifically thinking about is Goldman Sachs on the other side of AIG and um, you know things were arranged so that they got what they were owed by AIG. And um, due to the legal doctrine of limited liability, the value of the equity can never be negative. So um, with in Merton's model where the liability is bounded above, um, Merton described equity as a call option in the assets of the firm with strike price equal to face value of the debt. But if you instead consider what I would argue is a more realistic liability structure where liabilities are not necessarily bounded above, then the firm's liability can instead realize to an arbitrarily large amount. And um, so in 2010, Dilip characterized equity as a call option on the spread between risky assets and risky liabilities. These risky liabilities can be arbitrarily large. And um, the strike price of the spread option, he made zero. Um, and um, so the government is actually writing the spread option to the shareholders because the equity holders still have limited liability. So the government has an incentive to ensure that the ex ante value of the spread option is not overly large <laughs> since they're the writer. And um, now the government can lower the value of the spread option by requiring that the firm hold riskless capital, call it C, on the asset side of the balance sheet. So, you know, if you basically say to a firm, well, right now all your assets are risky. I want you to sell half and replace with something riskless. Uh, in fact, it's the government, so it might as well be their debt. Um, then, um, you know, obviously the total assets gets less risky. So, so when you look at equity as a spread option on the risky assets, now there's a strike price and that's not zero, it's C. So you just bring the positive C on the asset side over to minus C on the liabilities side. And um, so anyway, um, in Rubenstein's model, which was displaced diffusion for assets, um, the constant C that's held in cash, um, let's say the bondholders force the equity holders to hold cash. Okay, it was determined by the holder of the bounded liabilities to the bondholder as a way to raise the minimum payoff. Um, in Medan's contrasting view, the cash amount held C is instead determined by the government and the incentive of liability holders to monitor capital is in fact mitigated by the existence of a government <laughs> determined to both enforce limited liability of equity and to make whole the holders of a firm's unbounded liabilities. So let's say there's a well-known literature in corporate bond pricing that the bondholders should be monitoring the assets of the firm, um, make sure there's no risk substitution. And um, let's say, the point Dilip's making is that while that incentive is still there, it's mitigated by the fact that there's a government who's also uh, checking the um, composition of the assets of the firm. So let me just summarize. Um, so we showed that in the same year that the Beatles broke up, 1970, um, Merton wrote a working paper which not only contained a no arbitrage argument that revolutionized derivatives pricing, 
but also gave the world an intuition for thinking about both sides of the market value balance sheet. And um, we gave a couple of examples of how noted academics, so Rubenstein and Medan, have extended Merton's original simple contingent claims analysis model into a way to gain understanding into the complex interplay between private and public institutions. Let me just finish with um, some October surprises and a shameless plug. So according to Wikipedia, the definition of an October surprise is a news event deliberately created or timed to influence the outcome of an election, particularly the one for the US presidency. So of course, one wonders if today's COVID announcements is an October surprise in this sense. <laughs> and uh, on, um, so turning the clock back quite a ways to October 29th, 1929, that date was called Black Tuesday. It um, hit Wall Street. Um, at the time, an exorbitant amount of shares were traded, 16 million. <laughs> I don't want to tell you how little that is in terms of today's volume. And, um, but according to Wikipedia, billions of dollars were lost then, uh, wiping out thousands of investors. So um, since that date lives on in infamy, um, I'll just mention that on the coming October 29th, um, at 6 p.m., I'll be presenting a paper in NYU's Brooklyn Quant Experience that we affectionately call the BQE because around here that's called the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. And um, the topic I'll be talking on is a new way to value optionality um, that lends itself to quantifying early exercise. So I hope you can join us. Okay, so that's it for me. Um, let me do stop share, but if anybody wants to um, bring up, have me bring up a slide, I'm, I'm happy to. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... That was a wonderful talk. Uh, I always enjoy history, and this was very good. Thank you. I, I, I want to have a question. How about Ed Torp? Uh, does he play yeah. any role in this, or should he get some credit? I don't know if he used arbitrage or just brute force, but you know, he, he had some stuff before at this. Or yes, this, absolutely. Like yeah. So the, the talk you, you mentioned at the beginning of my talk that you saw before yeah. actually um, talks a lot about Ed Thorpe. And um, so he had a book come out recently called The Man for All Markets. That's right. Book. <laughs> so, uh, and um, it's just convenient that you uh, brought that up. And um, so um, in 1968, so before that Merton working paper, um, Thorpe um, published a book called Beat the Market. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> in that book, uh, he um, does talk about um, something you could loosely call delta hedging today. Um, the reason I say loosely is um, that he, um, while he is thinking of dynamic trading, he's not thinking of continuous dynamic trading. Okay, so he, he basically sets up a convertible bond portfolio by agreeing uh, long the convertible and short the underlying stock originally to make, you know, delta based on Black-Scholes model actually, or more or less. Yeah, I mean, it's fair to call it that. Black-Scholes model zero. And then he just sort of monitors delta. It will wander away from zero. And when it gets sort of too big, he resets it to zero. So and the reason I cavalierly just said that Thorpe was using Black-Scholes model in 1970 is it's kind of what you, it, it all depends on what you mean by the Black-Scholes model. So if you think what I mean by that is he was using their assumptions, then I take it back. Um, what he was actually using is their formula and um, he derived that formula by assuming that the expected return on the stock is there's free rate. Just as I said, Merton did that for bond pricing actually. And um, so, so anyway, um, so definitely Thorpe deserves a lot of credit. Um, you know, he, um, he's not actually cited, by the way, in these early papers by um, Black and Scholes and Merton, and that's perhaps an oversight. Um, I can actually understand why Merton didn't cite Thorpe. Uh, it turns out his advisor, Merton's advisor, was Paul Samuelson. Samuelson Thorpe escaped, wrote a scathing review of um, Thorpe's um, 1968 book uh, called "Beat the Market," and um, <laughs> let's say I should. Sure graduate. So, uh, so I can understand even if Merton knew about the book, why he didn't cite it. Um, <clears throat> so, 
Uh, one last thing about Ed Torp uh, in his book, he claims that he had a uh, pricing formula for the American option that worked better than anything out there. And he never, do you know if he ever published it or is he really uh, uh, talking just, uh, you know, his <laughs> book or, the, <laughs> or has he yeah. ever had uh, that? Uh, yeah, I know what you're else. saying. Yeah. So the uh, subtitle, by the way, of the book, I don't know if you can read it, it's pretty small yeah, yeah, yeah. for you. The subtitle of the book is How I Beat the Dealer and the Market. Uh, so um, let's say um, he's not shy in. Um, no. Say, um, reminding us of his accomplishments. So um, I don't actually know about uh, Thorpe's contribution to American option pricing. Um, I'm looking now, well, I'm making the mistake, I would say, of looking now for American options in the index, but I know that's a mistake because the term was actually invented after the book. <laughs> so, <laughs> so maybe I should be looking for early exercise. And um, so um, I'll have to take a closer look. I'd appreciate the reference. Um, because I don't, I don't actually know. Yeah, he describes a, a lunch he had with Black, and they were okay. going to share a stuff, and he was going to share with him his American option or early exercise, and then he realized that Black was not even close to discovering his formula, so he basically didn't oh, show okay. it to him. <laughs> yeah. He went to show it to him, but never showed it to him. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if 50 years later, we're not even close to being at his formula, to be honest. Yeah. Um, so progress in American options is slow. Um, so that's interesting. All right. Uh, any question from the, from the audience or, or the panelists? I had a, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I want to engage you, Peter, a little bit because you're going into history and so let's go into future a little bit. <laughs> so I was thinking about uh, this whole development of option pricing from Merton, Black Scholes, Black Scholes and Merton, we went into Heston as a new big advance and then we went into jump models like, you know, June Pan and then the SVJJ model and all the stochastic world theory and jump models. But here's what happens when you do that. As soon as you go into jump stochastic voltage models and we fit them with realistic option data, when you do that, you get expected terminal call prices such that the expected terminal call returns are not only less than riskless rate, they are negative. Now there are results that expected terminal option pr call prices if they are negative, that means you don't have risk aversion in the economy. So that means the, the whole framework of extending Black Shoals and Merton with volatility, what volatility does is it is, yeah. it, is, it is both ways. You know, what it does is it makes the price and call of put both more expensive. So, so on the call side, it increases risk seeking. On the put side, it increases risk aversion. Right. Yeah. When you Let me comment. I don't think it's anything yeah. to do with the so, so the question I have I mean, for no, you but you're referring, I think, to the u shape measure change. Yeah. So there's a okay. hole in there's a hole in SVJ models and SVJJ models, which is this: that the formulas are there, and you can have a closed form solution, but the parameters are such that you have negative call expected returns, so you don't have risk aversion. But the models were derived using a representative investor for which risk aversion applies, right? Otherwise you don't have equilibrium. So all of these models, SVJJ and all, actually are not fitting some underlying fundamental equilibrium which would justify them because risk aversion, they're not consistent with risk aversion with realistic parameters. So way out, I think. Yeah, so let me just come in. Um, well, so. So how do you? I, mean, I, I spent 20 years on Wall Street, and let me tell you, nobody on Wall Street thinks of derivatives pricing as an exercise in applying equilibrium. Um, they do think of it as, you know, as no arbitrage. And um, you know, so you know, you, you can, you're, it's perfectly fine to have, you know, someone display risk of risk seeking, you know, in some future state of the world at some point, and. Um, you know, still priced by no arbitrage. There's no inconsistency there. No, but why don't you redo it this way? There is a model by Bailey, cumulative prospect theory. So you okay. take a physical process like SVJG, physical, not Q, okay. and then you assume a utility model like cumulative prospect theory. Combine the two. 
When you combine the two, the Q that you get is nothing that resembles the Q of Merton or Heston or any of them. P and Q have no resemblance. It looks some mm -hmm. very strange animal when you combine the two, but it's realistic. I mean, that, you know, explains investor behavior, cumulative oh, okay. theory, and your P is realistic and you'll get some very strange Q. But when you want to make P's consistent with Q in the form, then yeah. you get this inconsistency, the equilibrium in which these models exist is not there. There's no arbitrage, but under, in, in which market? That market has risk seeking, but representative investor is needed in some of these models, but he cannot exist because there's risk seeking and so on. You know? So that is the well, whole- that's the possible explanation. I mean, um, I've seen missing state variables as an explanation for U-shaped measure change. True. And, um, you know, so there's probably multiple ways to, to, you know, to price through it as using equilibrium if you really wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, let me just say that, you know, you could get an exact fit to option prices using local vol. Okay. That's what it's designed to do. <laughs> okay. So, so, you know, using local vol, um, you know, you would find a U-shaped measure change. So I don't want to say that, it's stochastic volatility or jumps that's responsible for the U-shaped measure change and hence the, let's say, appearance of risk seeking. Um, I think it's, it's more, it's probably more to do with the dimensionality of your model, or as you point out, maybe the, the one needs to model preferences more elaborately than typically done. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Well, thank you, thank you, Peter. Uh, anyone else wants to chime in? Any questions? Or we should call it a day? All right. Well, it's at least here in Massachusetts, it's a wonderful day outside, sunny, probably last one of the last few sunny days we're going to get before winter comes in. So again, thank you, Peter, for a wonderful conclusion to our conference. And thank you for all the participants. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. And hopefully next year we will see you in Boston. All right. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone.